and today as we gather together on this 4th of July weekend, uh, I, I want to try to highlight uh, both uh, uh, our, our, our freedom and our faith. And, and the message that I've put together here, uh, we're, it's going to you know, take us into that communion time, uh, but to understand the emblems of freedom and the emblems of faith. And when I say emblems, you know, we talk about symbols, we talk about uh, the, the illustrations or that which represents or, or, or highlights uh, freedom and highlights uh, the, the faith that we have. And so uh, I, I want to s- start off with uh, the scripture from John chapter 13. So if you take your Bibles, turn with me to the Gospel of John chapter 13. It's the occasion where Jesus is meeting with his disciples. And we often use uh, the, uh, the passage from Matthew when we take communion. And we'll be doing that later on at the end of the service. But from John chapter 13, we have Jesus doing something uh, with his disciples in that upper room that's not recorded anywhere else. And I want to uh, use this passage to then just understand the representation of emblems in our lives and, and uh, emblems of our country, emblems of our, uh, uh, of our Christian faith, and, and to just, uh, uh, to, for us to draw closer, draw closer to the Lord through this time. Well, John chapter 13, I don't want to read the entire chapter. I'm going to uh, read uh, a number of verses and skip a couple, but uh, just follow along with me. I'm reading from the NIV. But see what's going on here and, and, and just kind of get in your mind the emblems of faith and the emblems of freedom. John records in his gospel these words. It says, it was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. The evening meal was being served, and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Then skip down to verse 12. (coughs) It says, When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked his disciples. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. And let's skip down to verse 21. After he had said this, Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified, I tell you the truth, one of you is going to betray me. His disciples stared at one another, at a loss to know which of them he meant. One of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. Simon Peter motioned to this disciple and said, Ask him which one he means. Leaning leaning back against Jesus, he asked, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. Then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, son of Simon. As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. What you are about to do, do quickly, Jesus told him. But no one at the meal understood why Jesus said this to him. Since Judas had charge of the money, some thought Jesus was telling him, to buy what was needed for the feast or to give something to the poor. As soon as Judas had taken the bread, he went out and it was night. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your word. And we thank you for the the things that you give to us to help us to understand your truth, emblems of truth, emblems of faith, emblems of freedom. Lord, in a few moments, we will be holding the emblems of the cup 
and the bread. Lord, draw us close to you as you draw as you had drawn your disciples close to you that evening. Lord, I pray this morning that you would draw us close to you. And God, that we would just experience your truth. And Lord, we would trust you. We would trust you as our Lord and our Savior. We pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, this, this message today on this July uh, 4th weekend, I, I've entitled it Emblems of Faith. And uh, I, I want to kind of have a part one and a part two. And, and the part one is to kind of uh, look at what I'm calling American Emblems of Freedom. I don't know, how many liked history in, in, in school? Did you like history? All right. I, I always found history uh, interesting. I know people say they, they rewrite history or they, uh, uh, you know, what, what really happened there, you know, books and history books and documents and, and so forth. But I, I want us to have a little bit of a history lesson here today. All right. I, I, I did some research, you know, and had some fun with it. But I, I, want, I want to look at uh, some emblems of faith. Uh, or not, excuse me, emblems of freedom first, and then we'll look at some emblems of faith second. And so uh, we, there's a lot of emblems that uh, uh, we see that are emblems of our nation, our, our country, and a lot of them are going to be uh, uh, out uh, this weekend, and uh, you've probably seen them. And so uh, I just want to highlight three emblems. There's a number of emblems out there, but the, uh, the first one I want to uh, highlight is... Uh, uh, the emblem of our, of our flag. Now we have a flag over here uh, that uh, is always there, our, our, our American flag. We have our Christian flag uh, over here to uh, my left, your right. But uh, our American flag, uh, you know, let, let, let me, you know, let's have a little fun here. Uh, how, how many know how many different kind of American flags there have been since 19, or excuse me, 1777? Anybody know how many renditions or editions uh, uh, of the flag there have been? Hmm? One? No, a lot more than one. <laughs> 27. There's been 27 different kinds of American flags. Now, they've all had red, white, and blue to them, all right? But there's been 27 different American flags uh, in our 200 and almost 40 years, all right? And so this is uh, the flag we have now, the 50-star one. Uh, that's our 27th design, if you will. Uh, and uh, uh, it's, it's, with the, it's, it's lasted the longest. 55 years we've had uh, this, uh, this flag uh, as our, our, our flag that we've had. Now, you're already looking at this and saying, what flag is that behind me? I'll get to there. It's a very unique flag. It's a very unique, unique flag. Now, the second uh, longest flag or the, the, flag, the, the, the flag that we've had has been the 48-star the one, all right, before uh, Alaska and Hawaii were added as states. And that, last, that, that flag uh, was raised for 47 years from 1912 to 1959. Now, the flag behind me on uh, uh, the, uh, the, the screen is the third longest duration of a flag. Now, what do you notice that's unique about that flag? 15 stripes and 15 stars. And for 20, uh, 23 years, this was uh, the flag. Now, this was the, the flag that was uh, uh, after there was the 13 original colonies, the 13 original states, and then when Kentucky and Vermont were added, uh, that made 15, and so they went with 15 stripes 15 stars, but when, uh, when more states were added, they went back to the 13 stripes to honor the 13 original colonies or states uh, that were there. And so, uh, so there, was, there, there was a flag that had 15 stripes, 15 stars. Now, uh, the thing about our, uh, our flag that we have currently, 50 stars, 13 stripes, uh, interesting about this is that the design of the flag that we have Today, the design uh, of that flag was made by a 17-year-old uh, high school student. It was part of a school project, and he got a B-minus for it. <laughs> he got a B-minus for it, 
but then when uh, uh, when uh, the the, uh, uh, the American government uh, you know made it the the design for the American flag, his teacher reconsidered and gave him an A. So anyway, his name was Robert Robert Heft, and uh, and again. Uh, uh, that's the flag that we have now. Now, the interesting thing about the flag, we see the flag all over the place now. Uh, we have a little flag up here uh, over the Bible here, and uh, you see the flag everywhere. Well, uh, initially, the American flag, American flag was just used for military posts, all right? It was just strictly uh, a, a mil military emblem. But it was uh, during the Civil War that the, uh, the flag became more prominent uh, with the... Uh, with the with the with the Union and no, the Northern armies and and that uh, the flag went from being uh, uh, individually uh, uh, hand sewn to uh, manufactured uh, more massively and people would put it over their homes people would put it over uh, over uh, churches and over storefronts and and if you call it patriotism or whatever the American flag became very very prominent very personal and not just for military, military use. But the American flag is probably our number one uh, emblem of freedom that we have. The second, uh, second American emblem I wanted to highlight is that of the eagle. All right? And, and the, this actually started out as a seal. Uh, when it's not a seal, meaning a mammal seal, but a seal as, as, a, uh, as a, a designation that, that the eagle would be our country's seal. That would be on documents. It's on our, our, our dollar bill. The eagle is there. And, and so the eagle, uh, when, we, when we look at uh, uh, how that became uh, an emblem of freedom, uh, it was commissioned in, in, in 19, or seven, excuse me, 1777 uh, that uh, a committee uh, was uh, put together to uh, design a seal. Well, it took, it took six years. It took six years and three more committees and uh, as, part, as, as part of uh, that original committee, uh, there was a little conflict that, that was there. And, and that, uh, that, uh, that original committee, uh, July 4th, 1776, that was put together was made up of Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, and Benjamin Franklin. And they were commissioned to design a seal for the newly formed nation that was uh, called the United States of America. Well, again, they... Uh, uh, the, the, the designs that they came up with, Jefferson and Franklin, were outright rejected. And in their place, artist William Barton proposed a design featuring an eagle. Now, Benjamin Franklin wasn't too happy about that. Right? In fact, he's quoted as saying, the eagle is a bird of bad moral character, a rank coward. <laughs> and that was in a letter that he wrote to his daughter when he kind of was venting about probably his design being rejected, which he wanted to be, wanted to be the turkey. All right, so again, Franklin's passionate disapproval was not without reason, because the eagle, often sm other smaller mother birds, would chase eagles to protect their young, and Franklin felt that this mouse chasing the cat imagery was not a proper emblem for America. But anyway, we have now the eagle as our uh, American bird, our our, our emblem of freedom and the seal that we have. And so uh, that's how the eagle uh, came about there for that. And then thirdly, the third emblem of freedom I wanted to highlight for you on this history lesson that you're having at Webster Assembly of God is the Liberty Bell. And I find the Liberty Bell, Liberty Bell to be most interesting. Now, what do we know, what do we know about the Liberty Bell? Well, we're, we, it's our understanding that uh, that it, it, was, it was rang when, uh, when uh, the Declaration of Independence was read and that it was cracked at, at that moment, and uh, that's not the case. That's not the case. That's not the case. That actually uh, comes from a fictional story uh, that, was, that was written uh, that people really liked and said, well, that's, uh, you know, that's, what, that's what happened. But the, the thing about the... The thing about the, the Liberty Bell, and, and again, it didn't get that name for some time, actually. Uh, the Liberty Bell that is in Philadelphia there. Uh, the Liberty Bell was actually, it started, it, it, was, uh, it, was not, it was not so much a gift, but it was given by the Pennsylvania Assembly. They ordered 
uh, the bell. It was called the Union Bell at first. The Union Bell uh, was ordered in 1751 to commemorate the 50-year anniversary of William Penn's, all right, the founder of Pennsylvania, his 1701 Charter of Privileges. Now, the thing about this would have been Pennsylvania's original constitution as a state. But this, this, this Charter of Privileges speaks of the rights and freedoms valued by people the world over, not just for America. It was very forward thinking of William Penn that dealt with religious freedoms, that it was his liberal stance on Native American rights, and his inclusion of citizens in enacting laws in a new nation. And so that this Union Bell that was uh, first uh, commissioned uh, had, had nothing to do with the Declaration of Independence. It was a bell that was there, uh, there in Philadelphia, and it was a bell that just really didn't ring right from the very start. I mean, it was a bell that <laughs> whatever happened, uh, it, just, it just didn't work. And it was, it was cracked multiple times. And uh, uh, now, but the interesting thing about this, this bell, the original bell, there's a scripture on the bell. Anybody know the scripture that is on what is the union bell that we now call the Liberty Bell? It's the scripture from Leviticus, Leviticus 25.10, that spoke of, of the, the 50th year, the year of Jubilee in scripture. And so again, when they commemorated this time, it was at a 50-year anniversary of William Penn's uh, charter of privileges that were there. Well, the thing about the Liberty Bell that uh, uh, has become an emblem of freedom for us is that uh, it, it's, it's become, uh, it, it was, the, uh, uh, it was the, the emblem, it was the, the rallying cry uh, for those that uh, wanted to abolish slavery, the abolitionists. And they gave it the name Liberty Bell, and that was in 1837. And, and so it was, uh, uh, it was from there then that uh, it was a bell that was uh, symbolism of freedom. It was a bell that uh, went on tour around the nation uh, for women's rights to vote. And so again, it has been a bell that has become an emblem of freedom as we know it now today, but uh, uh, as far as it ringing on that day when the Declaration of Independence uh, was read, no, the historians believe that it was not one of the bells that rung. There were many bells that were rung that day, but the Liberty Bell was not one of them. So hope I didn't crack your bell with that, uh, that, that bit of truth there. Well, okay, we wanna you know, have a little fun here with some history and American emblems of freedom and uh, uh, maybe tomorrow you can have some conversation as uh, you celebrate the 4th of July and you, 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 you see the flag and uh, uh, you can maybe maybe win some side bets with uh, uh, telling somebody that they're, uh, ask them if there was a, uh, a flag with 15 stripes uh, and see if they know that or not. But now I want to get to the real meat of my message here and as we uh, prepare for communion, I want us to look at our Christian emblems of faith. We say, what do you mean Christian emblems of faith? Well, again, as human beings, you know, we, we, we need things that remind us. We need things that, 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 that help us, that, that give us, if you will, something to hold on to, something to take hold of uh, about uh, our faith. And, and God in his infinite wisdom, he, he, he created us and, and he, he, knew we, uh, we, he, he knew we needed those things to take hold of. Uh, to give us some substance to our faith, if you will. And, and so we have what I, what I call Christian emblems of faith. And I want to share uh, these three sets of emblems, if you will, uh, and, and to just uh, draw us to that place of um, uh, just strengthening our faith, renewing our faith. Or if, if, if there's no faith, that maybe you'll see uh, the, the answer in Jesus Christ and have a faith in him today. Well, first uh, one I want to highlight is that of the cross and the grave. The cross and the grave. Do you know the cross is still the most universal emblem and symbol out there? Universal. This is not just America. But around the world, the cross 
is still so significant of a symbol. And uh, it, it's actually still the most, uh, it's the most used symbol in jewelry, cro the cross. Uh, you know, and there's different types of crosses. And, and the cross has been uh, shaped and, and decorated differently. But the cross is still a symbol that mankind has been able to take hold of. And sometimes people will wear a cross and, and they, don't, they don't even know why. But just because, uh, it, again, it's so significant. And to me, that, that speaks again to the evidence uh, of, of what Jesus Christ has made the cross. And again, we need to understand this. Now, the reason I link the cross with the grave, there have been many individuals who have died upon a cross. Historically, there are many individuals. To this day, there are still individuals that will be martyred on a cross around this world. But there was only one cross where the person who hung on that cross died and then rose again. He was placed in a tomb, and that tomb is now empty. And so we understand the emblem here of the cross and the grave, and, and that Jesus, again, there had been individuals, you know, uh, killed on crosses before Jesus. The cross was a, uh, was a, a mode of execution used by uh, the Roman Empire. Empire. It was a very uh, gruesome uh, execution. It was one that uh, brought a lot of suffering. It was not an execution that was instantaneous. But again, as Jesus uh, died on the cross, it fulfilled prophecy of the Old Testament. And it made it known, it gave evidence that Jesus was and is the Messiah, the Son of God. And that as he, do, as he died on the cross for us, and he was buried, and he rose again, it is the evidence of who he is. That he said he would die, he said he would be crucified, he was, and he said he would rise again, and he did. And that's the confession of faith. That, that we're told in Scripture that, that, that he who, who can gives confession, who believes in, in his heart and confesses with his mouth that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus died and the God the Father raised him up, you will be saved. You will be saved. And so we need to understand that that is the Christian emblem of faith, the cross, the cross and the empty tomb, the grave that Jesus was buried and rose again from. Well, the second set of Christian emblems of faith I want to highlight are set before you on this communion table. There's the, what we call the bread and the cup. Now, again, there's many times that uh, uh, as we look at this, it's a, it's a piece of bread. Sometimes it can be a whole loaf that is then broken and distributed. But these emblems of faith, are emblems that Jesus gave to his believers specifically and have been passed on historically. And we need to understand that, uh, that what we're about to do in a few minutes has been done by countless individuals. They could be individuals that have, uh, uh, you know, just been in a small group or in, in a big congregation. Uh, you could read uh, testimonies of prisoners of war taking communion to encourage one another, to strengthen one another, to keep on, to have courage. And we need to understand that communion, the partaking of communion is probably, uh, if, if you want to call it just a religious ceremony, it is the religious ceremony that is of the most significance. There's countless religions out there, but when it comes to ceremonies, communion is the most significant. And again, there's been uh, many denominations, many churches that uh, partake of communion, and there's uh, different modes, there's different frequencies. We, we partake of communion uh, at least once a month. Some will take part, uh, take, partake of communion every week, every opportunity when, when uh, uh, they gather together as believers. But the bread and the cup that Jesus gave to his disciples and that he said, as often as 
you do this do in remembrance of me. And, and we need to understand this communion ceremony, this communion observance, this communion expression, to me, is the evidence. One of the greatest evidence evidences that Jesus rose again. Because if these disciples that were in this room with Jesus that we read from John chapter 13. These disciples who, who uh, experienced this ceremony, if you will, with Jesus, if Jesus had not rose again, why, why would they observe it again? What would be their thought process to say, well, let's, let, 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 let's, let's do this again if Jesus did not rise again? If Jesus did not uh, fulfill that prophecy that he said he would die and rose again. I mean, this is evidence. The fact that it was carried on by the, by the disciples and has been carried on ever since by uh, church leadership. This is evidence that Jesus rose again and that the cross and the grave are connected with this communion uh, observance of the, the bread and the cup. And so as we, as we hold these emblems ourselves, it becomes something that we can personally, we can personally uh, take hold of and, and, and know that Jesus is alive. He rose again. And our faith in him is legitimate. It's sincere. It's real. It's real. And so whether, whether, uh, whether you do it individually or you do it as a congregation, to, uh, again, to renew your faith, to strengthen your faith, to take courage and, and, and to renew your hope. That is the purpose of these emblems, these emblems of the bread and the cup. And then lastly, the last set of Christian emblems of faith that I want to highlight that we read about in John chapter 13, and this is the only occasion where this is described to us within the Gospels. And it's the occasion of Jesus washing the feet of the disciples. And you probably never heard it put this way, but these emblems of faith I'm describing for you today is the towel and the basin. The towel and the basin. What, what, what does it say uh, that, that, when, uh, G, that Jesus, as he, as he met with them there in that upper room, it says that he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist, after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Now you're saying, well, what, how, how can you say that those are emblems of our Christian faith? You know, we, we, we do not have, uh, an, uh, we, we do not have a, a church ordinance of, uh, of feet washing. You know, we have water baptism and we have communion. And, and again, I'm not saying that we need to start washing feet here. But I'm saying we see the emblem of Christian faith here when Jesus put this towel around himself and he filled this basin with water and he washed his disciples' feet. Jesus didn't wash anybody else's feet as he ministered, but it was just to his disciples. But he taught them a lesson here and he said that you need to do this to each other, meaning serve each other. Serve each other. Well, I want you to see the significance of the towel and the basin here and why these are emblems of faith. Because when we know that Jesus was crucified on the cross, we're told that he was beaten, he was tortured, uh, that, that, uh, uh, you know, that a crown of thorns was, was pressed down upon his head. But we're told that he was stripped of his garments. He was stripped of his garments and, and, and that he was placed upon this cross. And so pretty much, I mean, the humiliation of being put upon this cross and, and to, 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 to be naked, to be stripped of everything and to be humiliated in such a way. And, and so we see that as what they did to Jesus on the cross. But the significance I want you to see here is that well before the cross, that Jesus himself, stripped himself to be servant for us. That he removed his outer clothing 
and, and put only on this towel. And he stooped at the feet of his disciples and washed their feet. And there's the significance there. The Christian emblem here is the washing, the washing of the feet, the, the, the dirt from the feet. The, the feet are the dirtiest. Uh, the dirtiest parts of the uh, of the body. The uh, you know as the disciples came into that room and it was customary that uh, that a servant would wash the feet of guests that would come into a room, and for whatever reason that time at that time uh, nobody did that and Jesus took on that role and stripped himself of his lordship and his uh, that he he said he was he was a teacher. And, and, and master and sa- savior and, and, and but he Jesus voluntarily nobody stripped him he stripped himself to wash the feet of, of, of his disciples and again the significance is that Jesus stripped himself of being Lord so that he could wash our sins he could wash our sins away he could uh, he, he, he could wash our souls uh, our hearts uh, and our spirits, so that we would be cleansed from all sin, forgiven from all sin. This is why these are Christian emblems of faith: the towel and the basin. So many times I've heard people say that, uh, you know, we say, "Well, the cross, the cross is where our our sins were forgiven." That the 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 blood was shed on the cross, the nails uh, were uh, were were put through Jesus's hand and and, and feet and. That, that it was on the cross that our sins were forgiven. And I've heard others say, well, oh, no, the, shed, the blood was shed uh, even prior to that when he was uh, at, at the Garden of Gethsemane and that he said he anguished and he prayed uh, so fervently that it said that his, his sweat were as drops of blood and that that's where the blood began to be shed because of the burden that Jesus was beginning to take there at the Garden before he was taken captive. But I would submit to you to say that even prior to that, prior to that, Jesus began to voluntarily strip himself naked, to to go from being the Son of God to being Master, to being Creator, to being uh, the, the Almighty Lord, that he stripped himself naked and he bowed at the feet of his disciples and he washed their feet. And he cleansed them. And, and that, uh, and, and, and as Peter protested, Jesus said, this was necessary. This was necessary. So I just give all this to you to, to say these are, uh, these are what represents our emblems of faith that highlight who Jesus is, that he is the Son of God, and he is the Savior of man. And, and that I encourage you to believe wholeheartedly who he is. And that just as you believe in uh, our nation, our country, and you see uh, the flag that uh, flies high, and you see the, uh, the emblem of the eagle, and, and even understand uh, uh, really the, uh, the misconception of the Liberty Bell. But to know the truth, the real truth, the sincere truth, that it doesn't matter what nation you're from, it doesn't matter uh, what, what nation you pledge your allegiance to, but to know that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and he came to be your Savior and that there are emblems of faith that give us evidence of who Jesus is and that the cross and the grave, the bread and the cup, the towel and the basin, are just things that God has given to us to reveal the truth, to show us the truth, things that we can take hold of and we can believe and know our faith is sincere.